This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and thanks for tuning in today to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I've been practicing over 25 years now. I started this podcast because I wanted to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be very interested in psychological and emotional issues, perhaps to those of you who have just been diagnosed with depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, whatever it happens to be, or you have a relationship problem that's a little difficult. But there's that third group. And this one especially interests me because there's so much stigma and misinformation about mental health treatment. This is the group who say they would never darken the door of a therapist, but they might just be willing to tune into a podcast. So welcome, whichever group you may be in. Or as someone laughingly told me a few weeks ago, you ought to have a fourth group, which means the people that can't afford therapy. So I hope this is helpful to any and all of you. I started out this episode thinking it was only going to be about the difference between denial and distraction, but I decided that I really wanted to talk about a few other what are called defense mechanisms. Distraction can get a bad rap from some in psychology, but I believe it has an important function. Distraction can entertain, it can ease a burden, if only for a short time. Distraction can remind someone that they can feel better. If you get away from pain, sorrow, grief, or loss, whatever you need distraction from can be quite handy and even good for mental health. But distractions are not so hot when they get confused with denial, basically not dealing with or even admitting that there's an elephant in the room, there's a problem. We'll define denial as a very basic psychological defense and one that if overused literally can cause you to be out of touch with reality and can cause huge relationship problems. Many of you know that I have a passion for writing about what I term perfectly hidden depression and there's certainly a lot of denial in hidden depression, especially when tough emotions are connected to childhood trauma or conflict. But there's another defense mechanism that people with perfectly hidden depression really use a lot, and we'll talk about that one as well. Our listener email today is from a teenager whose mom has two completely different ways of being. So her daughter writes trying to understand how to approach her. I get a lot of these kinds of emails, so that's one of the reasons why I chose this particular one. So welcome to Self Work. Come and distract yourself by listening to the podcast or learn more about denial and other things you may do to ward off stress and pain. No one particularly knows the exact origins of the term, the elephant in the room. I looked it up. It could have been from a 19th century novelist who wrote a story about a man who went to a museum that was filled with intricate pieces of art and didn't seem to notice that there was an elephant in the room. Some suggest it was based on an old Indian term, and a reporter used some kind of term like that in a Charlotte 20th century newspaper, so it's unclear. But most of us know exactly what that phrase means. Something's been avoided, denied, ignored, looked past, however you want to say it, because it's uncomfortable or unpleasant, perhaps even unseemly, if anyone uses that word anymore. My grandmother used it a lot. Or perhaps, as in the fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. Some manipulative scoundrels take advantage of the poor guy and tell him that they are weaving ornate gold clothing for him to wear that only those with taste, intelligence, and refinement can see. Of course, we know that the cloth doesn't exist, but the emperor and his entire court ooh and ah over his new attire. It takes a tiny child to point out and say, the emperor's buck naked. Now, that's the Arkansas version. (laughs) Before all of them wake up to the reality of the scandal. But one of the basic things about denial is that it is not akin to distraction. When you distract yourself from pain, it's not that you're pretending or denying that it's there. It's there, all right. You're just allowing your mind to get focused on something else. 
I was listening the other day to a favorite podcast of mine called Invisibilia on NPR. I highly suggest it. The stories are really good, I think, and I listen to the way it's produced to try and learn. The particular story that day was about a man, I think his name was Richard Kraft, whose beloved brother had died. Rather than grieving openly, he traveled to Disneyland, where the two of them had spent many a holiday, almost being Disney fanatics. The trip gave him so much joy and pleasure and sense of happy connection with his brother that he decided later that he wanted to buy Disney paraphernalia that was being auctioned off, literally pieces of rides, haunted houses, cartoonish cars, so he didn't have to travel to visit Disneyland and feel connected to his brother. His first piece was a huge plastic replica of Dumbo, the pink elephant that could fly. And for him, Dumbo served as a huge distraction for his grief. That cockeyed, silly grin on his face greeted him every morning. He thought about his brother, and he felt better. Interestingly, he ended amassing incredible amounts of Disney delights, and the story weaves on about how this distraction led this man on quite a journey. The author of the piece talked about a time in her own life. She had been 16 and told her father would die any day. She and her mother stayed at the hospital, but she kept her eyes on a coloring book that she found, and she spent hours coloring very carefully while her father died. She'd never been able to understand or even forgive herself for not being present for those days and hours. Richard's story helped her understand the role that distraction can play in loss and grief. As you're faced with the elephant that's in your own room, and that may seem impossible to know how to approach or change or embrace. I imagine people assume that a therapist might think that no one should ever distract themselves. We teach communication skills and guide others to work through trauma or pain. They might assume that a therapist would be dismayed at the thought of anyone distracting themselves from what they need to work through. But I actually don't. Distraction in and of itself is not a bad thing at all. Getting your mind off something that's difficult can actually be a lifesaver a time when you can turn down or even off sadness, fear, or grief, an experience that takes you away from some kind of reality that is burdensome or complicated, like a movie, a book, or a video game. I'm laughing because as an aside, I remember I I didn't ever understand the commercial for Calgon, which was an old bath salt that said, Calgon, take me away, until I had a child of my own, and I used to think, yeah, Calgon, take me away. Talk about a distraction. So I've had many a patient over the years who felt very obsessed by their thoughts. They were unable to clear their hearts and minds and couldn't seem to carve out an emotional break for themselves. Their grief or sense of loss was overwhelming them. And that's a terrible place to be. So the ability to distract is certainly not a bad thing in and of itself. Distraction only becomes a problem when it's your only go-to option. Just like if you have one primary feeling that you turn all your feelings into, be that feeling anger or worry or sadness. If that feeling is your only option and you dump all your other feelings into it, then you come across as always angry, always worried, or always sad. And there are certainly people who use distraction in that way. If things become too stressful, too overwhelming, too conflictual, you avoid by using distraction. You may tend to throw yourself into work or into church or into your kids, or you drink or smoke weed or gamble, or you distract by being all about other people, rarely focusing on your own fears or vulnerabilities or hurts. So let's get clear about the difference between distraction and denial. Webster's definition of psychological denial is a defense mechanism in which confrontation with a personal problem or with reality is avoided by denying the existence of the problem or reality. That's a defense mechanism. It always uses denial. But what's a defense mechanism? It's an unconscious strategy to cope with something very difficult. It's important to remember, denial and these other defense mechanisms are not things you do necessarily consciously when you know you're doing it. For example, if your wife is an alcoholic, you can deny the facts to yourself saying things like, well, she holds down a very stressful job. She couldn't do that if she were an alcoholic. You're not looking at the facts because you don't want to. You're scared to. 
and your mind almost protects you, again, unconsciously. Here's an even more raw example of denial. Your daughter comes to you and says your father, her grandfather, sexually abused her. You look at her and say, but he'd never do that. He loves you. You don't want to even consider what she's saying. Denial can be a huge problem in families and for individuals, especially in those situations where sexual, physical, and emotional abuse is denied. There are many defensive strategies that we all use to protect ourselves from pain or confusion, again, without being aware of it. And some are called more mature than others, meaning they are more complex and may even work in our favor. Denial, however, does not belong in that group. Now, I want to point out that denial is not shock either, necessarily. A lot of times when we have sudden loss or sudden trauma, we will be in shock, meaning it is a stage that your mind goes into to again protect you. But you're not necessarily denying that something has happened, although it can look very similar. You almost don't feel anything at all. In therapy, I see patients acknowledge their denial all the time as we redefine what's going on in their relationships with others, past or present. We all use the phrase, there are light bulbs coming on, as things they haven't seen or recognized are suddenly apparent. I hear things like, why couldn't I see this before? Whether it's labeling a relationship as abusive or enmeshed or addictive, whether it's beginning to stop denying that you drink too much or you work all the time or you're lonely or you never allow yourself to feel or you hide behind perfectionism, seeing denial for what it is and how it has served a purpose for you, how it's protected you or made something easier is a lot of what therapy guides you to do. You can also do this for yourself, however. But sometimes it does take someone objectively looking at you saying, I see the facts. Help me understand how you're interpreting them. And when you hear yourself answer that question, sometimes your denial becomes apparent. And you can begin to deal with the actual problem itself. Let's talk a bit about defense mechanisms. Now, Freud was the first, or he gets credit for being the first, psychiatrist, to talk about defense mechanisms. And this was back in the early 20th century. He believed that therapy was about bringing what is largely out of your awareness or unconscious to you into your consciousness. Again, light bulbs coming on. And as someone I just saw this week said, and once they're on, you can't turn them off. That's probably not true for everyone, but for her, it seemed that her light was always going to shine brightly. She had new perspective, or she wasn't in denial anymore, about some dysfunction in her family. What about other defense mechanisms? Other ways that we don't cope with that elephant? You bet there are a lot of them. Now, there are too many of them to go through here, but with the help of an article by Dr. John Grohall in Psych Central, we'll go briefly through another half dozen or so of them. These defense mechanisms may even cause a greater problem than exists in the first place. And again, if you've ever taken a Psychology 101 course, you'll probably recognize several of them. One is what's called regression. We see this in children of divorce, for example, when they begin to act younger than they actually are. They'll want a bottle or their pacifier back. They'll want to sleep with you when they've been sleeping in their own bed for a long time. Again, it's called regression. In adults, it can look like an abdication of adult responsibility after grief or a shock, acting as if you don't have a job to do. You can become so stressed that you act more like your teenage self and sulk, or you want to act impulsively. It's very unlike you, but you don't recognize it at first. Again, it's not a conscious choice. You are regressing to a different, earlier time of your life and how you reacted then. Another defense mechanism is acting out. When you don't feel a feeling, you don't sit with it. In fact, I love this quote from the book, I Don't Want to Talk About It. It says, if you don't feel it, you live it. So acting out is living out your feelings or your hurt or your pain through your actions. You don't know why you're doing those actions, but you do them anyway. It acts like a pressure release. And cutting or any kind of self-harm is in this category. Dissociation is another mechanism. This isn't having multiple personality. We all dissociate sometimes. I'm sure you've driven to work or home sometime and then not quite remembered how you got there or maybe where you were going when you got in the car. 
You lose track of time and even connection briefly with your own self. You get what's called lost in thought. People who've been sexually abused will tell me often that as it occurred, they, quote-unquote, saw themselves floating in the corner of the room, the mind protecting itself from the stress and trauma that was occurring. They saw it happening not to them, but almost to someone else. You can hear the protection the mind is trying to offer. Again, that can also become more of a problem if you dissociate regularly, and that is something you can seek a therapist help for. The fifth is what's called compartmentalization. I talk about this with perfectly hidden depression because people in that genre use compartmentalization in its most rigid form. This is not being aware that some part of you even exists. You may have experienced great trauma in your life, and you tell a therapist or a friend that you've never been abused. You truly don't associate with it. You've shoved it far away from your consciousness. You are defending against its reality. Again, in moderation, this can be healthy. If my dog died this morning and I still had to see patients later today, I would have to compartmentalize my pain about my dog dying. That's healthy. But if it's severe compartmentalization and it happens all the time, it's not good at all. Here are two more. You can probably hear that these are becoming a little more complicated as we go along. So the next one is called projection. You're feeling something that you don't want to feel and you project that onto someone else, something that they don't feel at all. Dr. Grohal uses the example of a partner being angry that their spouse isn't listening to them, when in fact, it's the angry spouse that's a poor listener. What that usually means is that you don't have much insight into yourself. One of my own favorites that I use to punish myself, really, is that if I'm ashamed or embarrassed about something from the past, I'll decide that someone else is probably thinking about that very thing or that very time, when in actuality, they don't even remember it. Or it's not important to them. I'm the one carrying it around, not them. And that projection is hurting me more than it's helping me. This last one is pretty fascinating. It's called reaction formation. When you convert something that may be dangerous for you to feel or think about into their opposite. Again, Grohald uses the example of a woman who's very angry with her boss and would like to quit her job. But instead, she's overly kind and generous toward him and expresses a desire to keep working there forever. She's incapable of expressing any negative emotions of anger and unhappiness and instead becomes overly kind to publicly demonstrate her lack of unhappiness. When you think about issues with racism, sexism, ageism, you often hate the way you're being treated. But the situation could be dangerous for you to say anything so you can again unconsciously adopt a quite different attitude. With a more tolerant society, you can talk about it. With an intolerant one, you cannot. Remember these defense mechanisms are things that we all do, hopefully more in moderation, because that's where they're helpful. But if they crowd into your life too much, they can cause real problems because you're not dealing with your own reality, nor perhaps the reality of the world that you're walking around in. If you're really interested in more information on defense mechanisms, you'll be able to find Dr. Grohal's article in my show notes. I got the question this week, well, where do I find the show notes? They are in the actual feed, now coming from Libsyn or coming from my own website. And you can find them at drmargaretrutherford.com under the tag self-work. We have a short listener email today. She says her name and that she's 16 years old. I just listened to your podcast about mothers with personality disorders and really resonated with it. I love my mom very much and still live with and depend on her. She's very loving and sweet and bubbly most of the time, but she has these episodes where she completely changes and turns into a vicious, emotionally abusive woman I don't even recognize as my mom. She will yell at me and blame me for ridiculous things, use something I confided in her about against me, and be completely irrational. She'll scream and scream and not care how much it hurts me. But after a day or two, she'll pretend like nothing happened. It's really harmful and hurtful as I try to rely on her support. 
only to have it taken away unexpectedly. I'm not sure what to do, as it is just me and her, and I depend on her financially and emotionally. I really need to make boundaries with her so that I don't get affected by her episodes, but it's very hard. I love her so much and enjoy spending time with her when she's being normal. Again, this kind of email is something I get a lot, so I really wanted to address it. Hello. The best thing for now is probably to educate yourself as much as you can about mood instability and where it can come from. Your mom might struggle with bipolar disorder, dissociative disorder, or a personality disorder, which also can cause very erratic behavior. There may be drug use going on. Books like the one suggested on the podcast about moms are more than helpful in determining what you could try. But realize, until your mom wants to take a look at her own behavior, then she may not do the work to change. But you can protect yourself, as you say, by trying to have more healthy boundaries yourself. For example, you may need to consider that when she feels safer, you can easily forget how bad it can be. And so you confide in her. That only gives her more fuel the next time she becomes irrational. Again, for that moment, you may be denying your mother's illness. You know it's there, but you are just for that moment saying, I'll be safe. This will be okay. Your mother may or may not have awareness herself of what she's doing. She sounds like either she's sort of acting out, allowing whatever her feelings are to govern her behavior, but we don't really know. She's certainly denying also the impact that her behaviors have on you. It sounds like there may be an element of dissociation as well. Your mom might not remember the time she's come out screaming. You might talk to her about going to therapy with you. That might be an avenue she'd explore, as long as it's not completely about her. And of course, it sounds like you could use the support and guidance of a therapist. Not only for this, but for some of the other problems she told me about, which I didn't want to reveal because I was a little afraid they would identify her too much. And of course, very pragmatically, as long as you're dependent on her, then that can be tricky. Maybe there are other family members that could help. Maybe you could begin looking for a job. You could go to your mom's friends. Don't think you have to handle this all by yourself. Good luck to you and take care. My podcasts on mothers with emotional illness, mental illness, do much better than many, many of the other posts as far as listeners are concerned or downloads. That's the only thing I have to measure. So I really wanted to include this because it is a very common problem and one that is very difficult to handle. I don't care what your age, teenager, or even if your mother or father has never sought treatment or help and now is 60, 70, or 80. So please advocate for yourself if you have this issue in your own life. Thanks so much for listening. You don't really know what it means to me to look at iTunes and see a written review or see that someone's giving me a positive rating. I like hearing about the things you don't like as well or that you would like to be different. I've been playing around with making some of the episodes longer, just a little longer, to see if I can somehow acknowledge that there are people who would like a little more information, but without going too far into the time, but not spending too much time trying to find a balance. They've also made some changes over at Apple, so your reviews mean more than ever. I had to take a lot out of the title because they're actually banning people from iTunes who try to oversell their podcasts, so I certainly didn't want to do that. So your ratings and reviews mean even more. And of course, word of mouth. That really helps. I can't tell you how just saying, hey, I really like Dr. Rutherford, or you know, she makes a lot of sense, or whatever you think about me. Some of you say I put you to sleep, so (laughs) I think that's a positive. You can subscribe on my website at drmargaretrutherford.com, and that's a really easy way to receive my weekly blog post and podcast. That's, again, drmargaretrutherford.com. You can email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. I'm over on Instagram, Dr. Margaret Rutherford again, Facebook, same thing, my professional page. Would love to have you there. And then there's this other opportunity. I have a Facebook closed group. You can reach that at facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. 
facebook.com slash groups slash self work. But remember to answer the questions. I read all the responses and that's the way I determine who's in the group. So I'm grateful for your presence today. I hope perhaps you can understand a little bit more of your own defense mechanisms, how they may work for you and when they may work against you. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.